Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are so good and that you are good to us, that you're not a hoarder of your goodness, but that you just pour it out on us. You're generous in every way, shape, and form. And we just bow our hearts before you this, this afternoon, and we put ourselves in a position to learn We sit at your feet, we open our minds, we open our hearts to you, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, for revelation. We ask you to give us wisdom. We ask you to just reveal to us things from your word that we've never seen before. Deposit rhema inside of our hearts. Bring clarity, connect the dots, give us aha moments. And I pray that you, your words would be in my mouth, that what you want to say would be clearly conveyed with everything that I say and that the words would be anointed and would go out and touch us and accomplish your purpose. I pray that you would protect the seed that is deposited within us tonight, that it would grow deep, it would have long and strong roots, it would bear much fruit. We thank you in advance for your work in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are in the prayer series Prayers, conversation with God. We're exploring the topic of prayer. We've said that prayer is intimate conversation with God where we strengthen and cultivate our relationship with Him. God loves to talk to us. And He comes to us every day with expectations of intimate conversation with us where He shares His heart and we listen, which means God is speaking to you. And then we share our heart and He listens. It's this dialogue, it's this interaction between the two of us. But if we don't really understand what prayer is, if we don't understand that it is that intimate conversation, then we're going to approach prayer as being a duty. We're going to view it as this ritual, or it's just something to check off our, our to-do list, and then as a result, it's going to be very disappointing for us. And our relationship with God is going to be dull, and it's going to be boring, and and we're just going to quickly blow through prayer to say we did it, because that's what good Christians do, is pray, so boom, let's just get it done and check it off our list. It'll never be what God intended it to be. And because we find it dull, because we find it boring, that means we're not going to engage in it very often, because we don't enjoy it. And so we won't be consistent in it. And as a result, then prayer will become this very segmented portion of our life. It'll be disconnected from everything else. So we're studying the Lord's Prayer uh, to change that perspective. Because the, the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' lesson on prayer. And it's not just the format for prayer. It's not just this, this, these words that we're supposed to say. And when we say the Our Father, that we've accomplished anything. Instead, it is a guideline by which we're supposed to be praying but greater than that prayer is the foundation for our relationship with God because prayer is a revelation of who God is and the more we know about him the more we'll fall in love with him the more intimate our relationship with him will become because we'll know him better and better And so because prayer is a revelation of who God is, it's giving us insight not only into his heart, but it's also telling us the things that he wants to talk about every single day with us. And as we do that, it transforms our prayer life, this segmented, disconnected part of our life, into a praying life where prayer is woven into the very fabric of our existence. It becomes a part of everything that we do and everything that we are. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. This is the version that we're studying. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. I am reading from the New American Standard Version because I kind of like the wording in this the best. This says, pray then in this way. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So far, we have covered the first two words, our and father. How many weeks are we into this? Five weeks. 
we are, we move fast. And we saw in that how Jesus has completely changed everything with those two very simple words, showing us the availability and the heart of God, as well establishing as well as establishing our identity. So with our God wiped away all the barriers, enabling all of humanity to see that God is available to everyone without any restrictions, that he loves everyone and he wants a relationship with everyone. He desires a relationship with every single individual human. Then in the word father, that opened up this new level of intimacy between God and man, showing us that God is our loving daddy and an affectionate daddy who is very approachable, who is very accessible, who desires for us to crawl up into his lap and just tell him anything and everything. What we feel, what we've experienced, what we're thinking, what's on our heart. The word daddy tells us that God is generous, that he's loving and an affectionate provider and protector who leads and guides us with wisdom. The word father also indicates that he is our disciplinarian and we kind of have shifted our understanding and definition of disciplinarian as it applies to God and that he's not this harsh, critical uh, taskmaster who just drives us and is abusive, but instead he's the disciplinarian who gently points us in the right direction that would take us into greater freedom and enable us to experience a greater level of his presence. And when we know God as our daddy, then we have a clear sense of who we are, of what our identity is. And when we know our identity, we have a strong sense of security and stability in our life. So last week, we began to look at the phrase, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. And so we discussed the holiness of God. So while Jesus did open the door of intimacy to all of humanity, showing us that God is Abba, he also wanted us to immediately understand that we must live in and be in and stay in awe of God. While there is this comfortableness in knowing God as our Abba and that he is very approachable, completely approachable, Jesus wants us to understand that the relationship that we have with God is very different from any other relationship that you will ever have, that you've ever had in the past, that you have now, or that you will ever have in the future. And our relationship with God is to be completely set apart and approached differently from any other relationship we have because God is holy. And when we say he's holy, we are saying that he is totally set apart from all of creation and anything that exists. He is totally different from us. He is in a completely different category. There's nothing that compares to him in any way, shape, or form. God is other. And he is so other that both he and his name are exalted, are raised in rank, are above anything and everything that we could ever know. And when we recognize his holiness, when we see how different he really is, when we understand how perfect and pure he is, and everything that he does comes and flows from that perfection and purity, then we will see that he and he alone is worthy of complete and total devotion and dedication and loyalty and passions. That he alone is worthy of our worship. Holy is your name is the entrance into worship. That's what Jesus is calling us to do there. Now we said last week that worship is the position of your soul. It is the stance of your mind, what you think, your will, your desire, and your emotions, what you feel. And when that is positioned correctly, it is bowed before God. And because worship originates in the soul, that means it's an attitude. It's a mindset that we're living in. So as we bow our soul before God, we are offering up extravagant respect and honor for and devotion to Abba. And we're proclaiming his greatness and we are declaring his worthiness. We're honoring who he is. We are declaring that he is worth everything that we are. 
He's worth our deepest affections. He is worth all of our adoration and our love. And, and we're honoring that and declaring that he's worthy. We're decreeing what his greatness is. We're talking about his attributes and his character and, and his worth and value. So because worship is an attitude, that means that's the lens through which we look at life, then that means that worship should be a way of life. And we looked at the verse in Romans 12, chapter 1, that calls us to make our lives a living sacrifice, and that is our reasonable it's our reasonable, it's not anything out ridiculous or outlandish, but it's our reasonable act of worship to make our life a living sacrifice. And everything we do is worship. Now, we talked about some, some demonstrations of worship, demonstrations of praise and worship. Uh, and we said that praise was an expression. It's an offshoot of worship that is a celebration of God, praise is admiration for who he is. It's being in awe of his wonder, it's shock at what he can do. It's being amazed by his acts, being overwhelmed by his love, just being basically stunned at how great God really is. And so some biblical demonstrations of worship uh, can be seen in the spoken word. It can be seen in shouting. You can shout words to God, but sometimes you can just shout just a cry of praise from the depths of your spirit to him. Playing instruments, clapping your hands, as in giving God applause for being so amazing. Raising your hands, bowing, dancing, all of those things are aspect of worship, which is a much broader picture than what we normally think of worship as being, which is the musical portion of our service prior to the message being delivered where, you know, we just sing. Well, that's just scratching the surface. Worship is so much more than that. But those things are only worship when our soul is positioned correctly, when it is bowing to God, when our soul is. The, act, the, act, the outside demonstrations that we do, the shouting, the clapping, the dancing, all of those things only equate worship when our soul is in a position to point toward God, to acknowledge who he is. But then worship goes so much further than that as well. Worship is also in the things that we say and do every day. So we said last week if somebody gives this snarky remark to you, Responding in love is an act of worship because it's, a, it's honoring him to respond in love. To have a good attitude when you could be complaining because how many of y'all know complaining is sin? Complaining is sin. And so when we choose not to complain, then we are worshiping because our actions are glorifying him pointing toward him because everybody knows you can't stop complaining on your own right because it just seems to be natural for us so that's kind of our recap so but I want to still dig a little bit deeper into worship because in my perspective the next question would be well then why why is Jesus pointing us toward worship yes absolutely in light of God's holiness worship should be the automatic response. It should be the natural reaction that we have when we see God in his holiness to worship. But like everything else, you know, the enemy lies to us. And so he is certainly lying to us about worship. And so he will whisper to us, you know what, all that isn't necessary. All that silliness, that hollering and dancing stuff, that, that's not necessary. Uh, worship really doesn't do anything. I mean, you know, it's just us singing some songs. I mean, clapping my hands, really. What does this do? What does that mean? Or, you know what, I don't ever really get anything out of worship. You know, it's amazing to me. And if you've said this, I don't know you've said this. So if your toes are stepped on, that would be God, not me, okay? Okay. Um, it's amazing to me how many people say, I can't wait to get through that music stuff and just get to the, to the message. That's really why I come is the message. And, and we can never separate one from the other. They're intertwined. 
But it says to me that if you are anxious to get through the musical part of Sunday, that you're probably not a worshiper, which means you're not worshiping Monday through Saturday. That that's not the attitude, the frame of mind, the lens through which you're looking at life. And, and that is a result of the lie of the enemy. Because you're thinking, I'm not getting anything out of telling God how great he is. It seems to me like he's the one that's, you know, really benefiting from this whole thing. I mean, let's just be honest. Those are some of the things that we think about a lot. And, and I'm not pointing any fingers or saying shame on you. What I'm saying is that's a product of the enemy whispering into our hearts because he's constantly trying to minimize worship. He says, he says lies to us like this, but he says them in the form of a question like we're being very, you know, thoughtful and intellectual. And he drops these, these questions into our heart and mind that raise some doubts and suspicions on our part about God. Like, okay, does God really need our worship? Is God needy? Is that why we're supposed to worship? Because he's needy? Is God egotistical or self-absorbed? Does he need to be propped up? Is his rule, is his kingship contingent on how much praise I give him? That my praise and worship is, is keeping God on top? Is his greatness enhanced because I said he was great? Is his power supercharged because I'm proclaiming that he's powerful? Is that why we do this? It's like, you know, we're like pumping the tire. We got to keep God inflated. See, I honestly believe that those are some questions that we struggle with. And most of us would never say that because we kind of know that would look bad on our part. But in reality, if you would say that, I bet somebody else would go, you know, I've thought about the same thing. I've wondered those same things. And I think that these questions and these thoughts that the enemy is constantly whispering into our heart about worship prevent us from worshiping with the abandonment that we're really designed to do. I think those questions are what keep us from incorporating worship th Monday through Saturday, and then when we get here on Sunday, we're kind of like, or we feel like we've really done something if we've clapped or we've, you know, done this. And the thought of, of doing anything outside of that is like, oh, I can't, I can't really do that. Because we have all of these doubts. I'm just going to look stupid and it's not really going to do anything. I'm going to be sticking out and people are going to be looking at me. So I think we need to answer the question, what is the reason, the purpose for worship? Yes, yes, God is worthy. And his existence alone is enough. For us to pour our hearts out to him but let's ask the question who's benefiting from this and is it necessary if we didn't do this what would happen would the universe fall apart would God lose his throne I mean what's gonna happen if we don't so let's answer these questions the first thing I want to say is uh, worship is not for God worship is not for God God does not need your worship God is self-sustaining. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. We are not self-sustaining. The proof of that is you got up and had breakfast, and then you had lunch, and you probably had dinner, and you might have a snack when you go home. Why is that? Because you need food to sustain your existence. Why else are you not self-sustaining? Because you need people. Leaving, living in isolation will make you slam crazy. You need people because that's the way we were designed. But see, God doesn't need anything. God fuels and empowers and maintains and sustains his entire existence independent of anything else. If every part of creation, what is in heaven what is in the heavens, what is on the earth, and all of humans were to disappear, God would still be God, and he wouldn't need anything else to be who he is. God is self-sustaining. He doesn't need us to prop him up. He doesn't need us to keep him on top. 
God is not great because I said he's great. He is not powerful because I made that declaration. God is great and powerful because of who he is. My worship is simply a recognition of that. It is an acknowledgement of that. The truth is worship is purely for our benefit. It is for our benefit. Yeah, he's worthy of it. Let's make no mistake of that. But we are the ones that are reaping the benefit of worship. We're the ones who need it. We just don't understand how badly we need it. Jesus is instructing us to worship because Holy Abba, as we exalt him, he changes us. It benefits us. Displaying extravagant respect for and devotion to God and proclaiming his greatness helps us. It benefits us. It blesses us. It enhances and enriches our life. So how does that happen? Well, I've got six things to share with you, and I don't want you to think that these are the only things that worship does for you. This is a small, small picture. These are just the only things I could fit in in, the right, in this time frame. Okay? So the first benefit that we get to worshiping God is that it reminds us of who God is. Worship reminds us of who God is. The human memory is really short. Really short. For some of us, it's shorter than others. And, and case in point being the Israelites. Now, let's, let's just have a quick history lesson to bring us all up to speed so we can remember the, the account of the Israelites. They had become slave of the Egyptians. And they were slaves for somewhere around 400 plus years. There was anywhere between 2 and 4 million Israelites who were slaves. And by slaves, that means they didn't earn a paycheck. They did what they did for nothing. And they are the ones that supported the economic system of Egypt. They were the cog in the wheel. They were, they were what kept everything going, everything moving forward. And they began to cry out to God for deliverance. They wanted their freedom. And so God came and through Moses who was the spokesperson for God, God set them free. And, and here's the, the, I mean, if you really start to look at the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt, it is a spectacular, miraculous, supernatural event. Because when Moses, as God's spokesperson, said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said no, God began to... Uh, impose upon them plagues, 10 plagues, 10 plagues they endured, flies and frogs and darkness and bloody water. I mean, it was a mess. Do you know that the 2 million to 4 million Israelites did not experience one plague? Not one. God supernaturally protected them. When everybody else's livestock was dying, Theirs was fine. When everybody else had frogs all up in their house, they had none. When it was pitch black and even a, a lantern could not extinguish the darkness because the darkness that God sent was so heavy and thick, it wasn't dark where the Israelites were. They had sunshine. That's amazing. And then when it was time for them to leave e Egypt... God caused the Egyptians to give the Israelites all their wealth. What? All their gold, all their silver, all their jewels, all their valuable possessions, they just turned over to the slaves who packed it up in their stuff and carried it out of Egypt. Y'all, when have you ever heard of anything like that happening? Never. That's God. They leave Egypt. They get to the Red Sea. They have no boats. 
have no boats. And what does God do? He parts the water and enables them to walk through on dry, not mushy, soggy, damp, muddy ground, but dry, rock-solid, hard, firm ground. And as they're crossing, their enemy is pursuing them. And, and they're coming, and God lets them get into the middle of the Red Sea and then closes the water, completely annihilating Pharaoh's army. So thoroughly defeating the Egyptians that they didn't even want to try to get back the, Egypt, the, the Israelites. God moved, destroying their economic system, robbing them of their wealth, and crushing their army. I bet Pharaoh wished he would have said yes the first time. That is amazing to me. And then a week later, one week later, seven days later, the children of Israel build a golden calf and worship it. Insanity. Unless you think they're morons, the same thing has happened to you. God's done some incredible things for you. And then two weeks later, where is God? What am I going to do? How is this going to work out? I just don't even know. We've done the exact same thing, immediately establishing a plan B. We heard about that on Sunday. That would be our golden calf, plan B. See, what the, what the, 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 the fault with the Israelites is the same problem that we have. They had forgotten. They were caught up in the moment of what was happening right then, of what, was, what they were feeling right in that specific moment. They made the calf because they forgot the euphoria of being spared of all the plagues and the delight of carrying the wealth of Egypt out with them and the shock and awe of crossing through the Red Sea on dry ground and the astonishment of watching their enemy completely destroyed. They had left that moment and now they were in panic. Wait a second, we're in the desert. What are we going to do? We've never been free. We've only lived underneath the tyranny of other people telling us what to do all the time. We don't know how to be free. We can't plant any gardens in the desert. How are we going to feed ourselves? There's no water. What are we going to do? And in the meantime, Moses has gone to the top of Mount Sinai to get direction for God from God for the next step. Well, he was gone a little bit longer than they thought he should be. Did he die on the way up? Did God kill him when he got there? Did he get lost? Did he just abandon us? Is he ever going to come back? Let's make a golden calf. <laughs> Completely logical. That's exactly what happened to them. See, when we worship God every day, which is what the Lord's Prayer is, it is a format <clears throat> for daily how we talk with God. If daily we're worshiping God then every day we are being reminded of who he is and what he has done and what he can do. And we're celebrating the greatness of God. Worship reminds us of who he is, keeping his character and his abilities in the forefront of our mind. And if we keep him in the forefront of our mind, in the moment where there's the opportunity to panic or to be afraid, well, that's going to easily dissipate in light of his greatness. And we won't be developing any golden calves, working out a plan B. In case you don't show up, I got a fallback plan. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are amazing about God that we can worship him for. Now, again, this is like our list of benefits. It's very small because we've got a limited amount of time. But here's the first thing that we can think about and meditate on and worship God about every day is that God is good. God is good and everything that he does is good. God is so good that we can't even begin to understand how good he is. God is so incredibly good that we cannot, it would be impossible to embellish or exaggerate or overstate or blow out of proportion how good God is. 
God is so good that he's better than you think he is. God is good. And when you know God is good, well, boy, that just kind of answers a whole lot of questions, doesn't it? Because if he's good, he's not going to leave you hanging. If he's good, he's not going to leave you high and dry. If he's good, he's going to take care of you. Right? Let's look at some scriptures about that. Go to Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love endures forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Go forward to Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do only good. Teach me your decrees. Now, these are just two out of dozens upon dozens upon dozens of verses that declare the goodness of God. And these verses tell us that God is good. He is good. Not that he has goodness about him or he has good ways or he just only does good things, but God is good. What that means is goodness is the essence of his being. It is the foundation of his character. It's his nature. And goodness only comes from him. He's the source of goodness. In fact, James 1.17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father comes from our daddy so God is good and everything he does is good and he cannot be anything but good and because he's immutable that means he never changes he's the same yesterday today and forever that means for all of eternity God will be good he'll never change and when I worship him and praise him for being good every day it reminds me it reminds me, it keeps in the forefront of my mind of how good God is. The next thing that we can worship God for is God's bigger and stronger than any problem you're ever going to face. There is not one thing that is greater than God. We've talked about this before, about the fact that there is no scale to measure the distance and the difference between God's power and authority and any other power they may be. It is so wide and expansive, it just cannot be measured. But if we were going to try to do it, we could say that if the devil were an ant, God's bigger than the universe. But that even doesn't adequately describe how great and powerful and how much stronger and bigger God is than anything else. There is nothing that is complicated for God. There is nothing that is difficult for God. There's nothing that makes him break a sweat. God doesn't even have to get up off of his throne to do anything. He's that big and that strong. There's not one thing that he cannot handle. He doesn't consult anybody. He doesn't have to go, mm, let's try this. Mm -mm. God's big, God's strong. Let's look at a couple of verses. Exodus 15, verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. Wow, that's a nice picture. God smashes the enemy. And I know the significance of the right hand, but in my own mind, I'd like to think, imagine if his left hand got involved. <laughs> Go to Psalm 24, 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. That word invincible means unbeatable, undefeatable. In any battle, it's really not a battle. You know, it's really not a battle. Because the presence of God shows up and wham, the enemy is gone. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Jeremiah 32, 17. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. So what's your problem? God's bigger than that. And when you worship God, it reminds you that God's bigger than anything you're facing. 
bigger than anything you're encountering, bigger than anything that you're going through. And then we can also praise and worship God because he's faithful, he is reliable, and he is able. He is faithful and reliable and able. Go back to Psalm 86, verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry, thank you, Jesus, and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. God is faithful. Uh, go, to, go backwards to Psalm 59, verse 10. In his unfailing love, my God will stand with me. God will stand with me. Now, jump over to the New Testament, Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 20. Now, all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely, infinitely, more than we might ask or think. I can ask and think some pretty big stuff. And he is able to do infinitely more. God is committed to you. He is devoted and dedicated to his relationship with you. God is dependable, promising to never leave you, but to always be with you. He is able, he's capable and competent and skilled and proficient at everything. Absolutely everything. There's not one thing God cannot do. And worship reminds you of that. Worship is a great reminder for me every single day of who I am who I am in relationship with. It reminds me of who he is. The second thing that worship does for you, the second benefit, is that worship shifts our focus. Worship shifts our focus. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 4. So as we're looking at who God is and we're reaping the benefits of that, then it takes our attention away off everything else and it's putting our attention completely and totally on him which always puts everything in the right perspective when our attention has been shifted away from what's going on around us and it is solely focused on him it changes our perspective worship will pull our thoughts away from us in our feelings and what we're thinking and the chaos or the confusion or the turmoil that we are in the middle of and it turns it toward his greatness now in first first Samuel chapter 30 and verse 4 this is an encounter that David had let me give you a little preference about that David has been anointed king but he is not king yet Saul is still on the throne and Saul is constantly pursuing him to kill him. So David is kind of living on the outskirts, keeping himself away from Saul. And with him is a band of men who support him, which is more than 600 men. And, and these men, including David, have their wives and their children who live with them in this community that they've built on the outskirts of Ziglag. And so David and his men, all the men, had been gone for several days, and they returned to find that the Amalekites, who are another people group hostile to the Israelites, to the nation of Israel, have invaded Ziglag and burned their compound to the ground, leaving everything in ashes, and have taken away all of their women and their children. And this is where verse 4 picks up. And they wept until they could weep no more David's two wives and I don't even really know how to say this so we're just gonna call her Annie David's two wives Annie from Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal from Carmel were among those captured now I want us to notice he grieved David grieved he wept until he could weep no more All right David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. More than 600 men were ready to stone David because they were blaming this whole thing on him. And then 
David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. David did not dwell in the tears. He didn't cry for days on end. David didn't focus on the tragic situation and circumstances. He did not focus on trying to calm these men down and save his own life. David's response to this tragedy, to the fear that he must have felt, to the anger brewing within his men, his response to that was to strengthen himself. Now, I want us to notice that David did not try to strengthen himself with self-talk, with positive talk. David didn't go, okay, buddy, okay, buddy, you can do this. You got this. You're a giant killer. You slayed Goliath. You can handle this. It's going to be okay. Let's just grab the bull by the horns and do it. That was not David's response. David's response was to strengthen himself in the Lord, to encourage himself in the Lord. That meant that David stopped looking at all of this and he started looking solely at God. And his strength came from worshiping God because he would not have been strengthened or encouraged by yelling at God or complaining at God or asking God, why did you let this happen to me? He was strengthened and encouraged because he quit looking at everything around him and he focused on the greatness of God, which means he worshiped. David worshipped. David offered up extravagant respect for and devotion to Abba and proclaimed his greatness and worthiness. And he completely stopped being so focused on his own emotions and how he felt and the pressure from the men and the grief. He disengaged from that, placing every bit of that, of his focus and attention on God, and he worshipped. So worshipped will shift our focus, which then leads us to the third benefit, is that worship puts us in a position to receive. Worship puts us in a position to receive. Now, we're going to continue with our story about David. Once David connected with God through worship, the next verse is verse 7. And then it says, Then he said to Abathar the priest, Bring me the ephod. And so Abathar brought that. Now, let's stop and, and talk about what an ephod is for a moment. An ephod is a part of the priestly garments that the high priest would wear, and it's kind of like a vest, and it covered their torso, their whole torso. It kind of went on like this. And, and the king of Israel would use it to ask God questions, and then God would respond to them through the ephod. I'm not even going to pretend to tell you I know how that worked. It was supernatural. Somehow God communicated through this vestment. And somehow David had access to it. And so once he took his attention off of this, shifted his focus to God, he was now ready to ask God what to do. And he was ready to hear from God on what the next step was. So, verse 8 says, Then David asked the Lord, Should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, Yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Now, if David had spent his time complaining and moaning and grieving and trying to protect himself from these men, he would have never worshipped. And if he had not worshipped, he wouldn't have heard from God that he could pursue them and been encouraged by the truth that he was going to get everything he lost back. If David had spent his time worrying, if he had spent his time complaining, if he had come up with a plan B, I'm going to hightail it out of here and go somewhere else. I got Saul trying to kill me. I got all these men trying to kill me. God, I wish you had never made me king because then my life would have never gotten this complicated. He could have gotten resentful toward God. But by being in that position, he was not in the position to hear 
Worship allowed him to be open and receptive to what God was going to tell him, which gave him hope and gave him encouragement, which is always what God will give you. Always. Number four, worship draws God near to us and shifts the atmosphere. Worship draws God to us and it shifts the atmosphere. We won't turn there because we're running out of time. But just write this down so you can look it up later. Don't take my word for it. Don't ever take my word for anything because I'm human. And I will at some point probably say something crazy. Psalm 22.3 says, Yet you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our total whole and complete dedication, loyalty, and passions being expressed as outwardly admiring and respecting and, and displaying gratitude for God builds God a seat of honor. It's a place for him to rest. And when we do that, the word is telling us he will come. He will come and sit he will come and dwell in the middle of our worship. God makes his home where there is worship. And that applies to us corporately, but that applies to you all by your lonesome in your prayer closet, in the secret place. It applies to you as you are taking a shower or doing dishes or mowing the lawn or driving your car. When you worship, you are building a place for God to come and sit and rest. And where God is, his presence fills the atmosphere. God's presence injects love into the atmosphere. It fills the atmosphere full of hope and joy and peace and rest. God's presence changes the atmosphere. It changes the environment that we're living in. Which takes us to number five. Worship debilitates the enemy. Worship debilitates the enemy. Psalm chapter 9 verse 3. Psalm 9 3 says, My enemies retreated. They staggered and died when you, you being God, appeared. My enemies staggered and died when you appeared. As we worship God and his presence fills the atmosphere, our enemy cannot survive in those circumstances. The presence of God is suffocating for the enemy. As we worship, as we build that place for him to come and sit and dwell and rest among us, God's presence increases. Because there's less of me and there's more of him. And, and, and particularly that's true in corporate worship where we are as one in unity exalting the name of God. God's presence comes in a supernatural way and where God is filling up the space, there's no room for the enemy. God's presence crowds the enemy out, weakening him incapacitating him it prevents him from operating the listen light and dark can't coexist can they so when God shows up God is light go back to our verse that that every good and perfect gift comes from our father of lights God is light when he shows up the environment changes because he fills it with his light the enemy cannot coexist where the light is that's a benefit. The more I worship, the greater the presence of God is in my life, in my environment, in the atmosphere, which means there's less activity of the enemy because the enemy cannot survive. It's not that he just can't thrive. He can't survive. He can't operate. He can't function in the presence of God, which takes us to number six. Worship changes our circumstances. I want us to turn to Acts chapter 16, verse 25. A little history, recap of what's taking place here. Paul and Silas have been, have been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. They have been stripped naked 
and beaten with wooden rods and thrown into an inner dungeon. And they had their feet placed in iron stocks. And I am quite sure that this inner dungeon was nothing like an American prison cell. That would be the Hyatt compared to what Paul was in. It was crowded. There were other prisoners in there. And I am pretty certain there would be some unpleasant body odor. Because they didn't have facilities down there. If you catch my drift, no shower, no bathroom. And there are those who say in Rome that today you can go to a place where Paul was imprisoned. And it is, I don't know if this is the exact same place that Paul was imprisoned in this incident, but if it's anything like what they say you can go visit today, you cannot even stand up fully in it. You have to stay hunched over. This is not a good place to be. But instead of being fearful, instead of complaining, instead of questioning why, God, I was doing everything that you said to do, you said you found me on the donkey on the road to Damascus. You showed yourself to me. You called me to preach. You told me to do this, and I've been obedient to you, and I've done every single thing that you've told me to do. And this is what happens? Really? See, Paul didn't do any of that. Does any of that sound familiar? But see, Paul didn't do any of that. Instead, Paul and Silas chose. They made a conscious decision to praise God. They made the decision to worship God. And as they worshiped, the atmosphere shifted as God's, pray, as God's presence came and inhabited, lived in, sat in, rested in their praise. And it filled their jail cell and their circumstances changed. Because let's read verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. That's the worship part, singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken at its foundations and the doors immediately flew open and the chains fell off of every prisoner. Their circumstances changed instantaneously because they worshipped and made a place for God to come and inhabit. Now, do you want to ever tell me that worship is about God? Not in any one of these instances or these passages that we have looked at tonight do I find that God was benefited by worship, that God got anything out of it, that it did anything for him other than draw him to the worshiper. Worship is about us. As we make everything we are about him, then he turns all that around and makes it about us. Worship is necessary for us. It is necessary for our spiritual health. It drives the enemy away. It changes the atmosphere. It changes my circumstance. It changes my focus. If my focus is changed, then I'm not depressed. I'm not discouraged. I'm not downcast. I'm not negative. I'm not complaining, which means I'm not dragging everybody else down around me. It keeps me whole and sound because it keeps worry at bay because worry will make you crazy. It keeps me from making a golden calf, a plan B, where I need other options. It keeps me reminded of God and who he is and his greatness. Worship is all about me. God doesn't need my worship. God is not enhanced by my worship. He is not egotistical. He is not just wanting to hear how awesome he is to inflate his ego. But Jesus is instructing us to worship every day through the pattern of the Lord's Prayer because he knows it is essential for us and it will benefit us because everything in your life changes when you worship. 
everything. There's not one aspect of your life that will be untouched by true worship. When your mind and your will and your emotions are bowed before God and honoring Him in what you say and in what you do and in what you think and in the choices that you make and the expression of your heart is just all of those things that we've talked about that worship is. So while knowing God as Abba establishes the relationship and it opens up the door to him, worship ushers us into his presence. And when we are ushered into his presence, that means we've gotten access into the throne room. Do you understand the, the significance of being in the throne room? That's where we walk in victory. That is where we gain the authority that he promised us. I want to live in the throne room. Crawled up in his lap, seated as he is seated on the throne of the universe. And worship is the only thing that takes me there. There is no other way to get into the Holy of Holies, the throne room, except by worship. And that is only available to those who are covered in the blood. Worship takes us into the throne room which changes our circumstances and when my circumstances are changed I'm changed but then sometimes it's not even about the circumstances it's just about me it's just about me changing and what this tells us is the strength the power the authority the the we all want to pray and have the supernatural happen right we all want to, you know, because Jesus said, all these things that I did, you're going to do and more. That takes some strength. That takes some powerful prayers. The strength and the power of our prayers begins with not just knowing who Abba is, but it also is, is tied into exalting him for who he is with our sincere devotion. The people who have prayers answered are the worshipers. The people who see the mighty acts done are not the people who are begging God to do stuff. They're the people who've laid on their face and honored him with their life. Worship connects you to the heart of God. Worship is where the power is. So how is this going to affect our praying life? How does this take us from that segmented prayer life into the praying life that is just woven throughout our being that means that we become worshipers it's not something I said this last week it's not something I'm gonna put my worship on uh, if you took it off you were in trouble you need to be living in it living in it constantly living in worship with that attitude and that mindset and that lens through which you're looking at life that is constantly honoring him. Everything is about him. It's not about you. It has never been about you. It will never be about you. It's about him. And when we put him in that place of honor and everything that we are doing is honoring him, Man, he just sits right in our life. And we are able to do that and worship him because, you know, sometimes we were talking about this the other night with some people and we were saying that sometimes our prayers kind of get repetitious and they get a little boring and we find that we've gone on autopilot and we're saying, oh, God, I worship you because you're so great and you're awesome and you're mighty and, you know, we're just kind of saying the same thing over and over again. And, and I don't know, we've talked about this before, I don't know about you, but if, you know, I had the exact same conversation with you every single time I saw you, I would be really sick of that conversation. And I would know that you weren't really engaging with me, but that you were on autopilot. Well, it's not any different with God. God wants a dynamic, ever-changing, ever-shifting conversation where we're growing in intimacy with him. How are you going to know all the different ways to praise him? All roads lead right back here, don't they? If you don't know how to praise him, open up Psalm. That's a good place to start. Open up Psalm and start reading Psalms to him. 
It's okay. In fact, God loves to hear his word. And he says that he watches over his word to perform it. So you don't know. You just go right to Psalm. And you say, oh God, my heart is confident in you. No wonder I can sing your praises with all of my heart. Pick a page. This is one of those times you can do this. You know? It's like the only time you should ever do that. It's full. The Lord is my strength and my shield, and my heart will trust in him. And then from there, I can just go, like, that's the only line I may need to read. God, you're my strength. And I remember when I was so weak, and I felt like my life was going to fall apart, and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't have any answers, and I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I thought I was going to lose my mind. You stepped in, and you gave me strength. When I shouldn't have survived and made it through that crisis, you, you strengthened me. You're my shield. You surround me and you protect me. God, that's amazing that you can do that. That, that 24-7, 365, your shield covers me and surrounds me and there's not anything that can penetrate it because you're undefeatable. No matter what the enemy brings against me, it's going to bounce off you because nothing can come against you. There's not even a battle when you're involved. We can go on 20 minutes with that, right? You should never, ever, ever, ever run out of things to praise God for. I can praise God because he parted the Red Sea. Now, I wasn't there, okay? So... I really don't know exactly what it looked like, but I can imagine in my mind, and I, I think it's pretty spectacular. So even though I wasn't there, I can praise him for the fact that he has the ability to separate water and instantaneously dry, make the ground dry and hold the water back. I don't know about you, but I can't do that. And I've never seen anybody else who was able to do it. I can praise God for that and be amazed for that. See, you don't have to just have been in the middle of it to be able to praise God for it. Because as I praise God for his mighty acts like that, it just reminds me that he can do mighty acts in my life because he hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if I need the St. Clair River parted, if I need Lake Huron parted to walk over on the other side, God will do it if that's what he wants to do. The point being is he hasn't changed. And if I need something that drastic and dramatic done in my life, God can do it. So open up the word of God. Dig into the word. Read and let the greatness of God wash over you and then just pour that back out to him. And it will change your life. It will change your life. If you just wait to Sunday to worship, you're missing. You're missing so much. You're deficient. You're worship deficient. It's like being vitamin A deficient. You're worship deficient. Step it up. Step it up. Step it up. And then begin to step out of your comfort zone and worship God in the biblical ways that we talked about. Bowing before him, dancing before him. It doesn't matter if you can dance. It doesn't really matter. Just like it really doesn't matter if you can sing. If your heart is bowed before him, he loves it. He loves it. He thinks it's beautiful. He thinks it's the most beautiful thing he's ever heard. It blesses his heart. It draws him to you. Do things, worship in ways that you have not done before. You will find that your life will change exponentially. Okay, let's pray. Father, you are magnificent, and there is nobody like you in all of heaven and earth. And I do worship you, and I celebrate you because you're good, and because there's not anything that you can't do, and there is not anything that you won't do to take care of your children. You are a provider. You are a protector. You are supplying our needs. You are being a shield about us. You are the glory and the lifter of our head. 
And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to just impregnate us with an overwhelming desire to worship you. Giving us a heart to dig into your word and discover how great and mighty you really and truly are. Take the scales off our eyes. Bring into sharp focus how magnificent you are. Help us never to take for granted all of the stories that we've heard and just go, oh yeah, we know that. But Lord, may we have a sense of awe and wonder and an amazement at your mighty acts and the greatness of who you are and the purity of your character. I pray for every single day that we are walking on this planet that that would resound within us. And that, Holy Spirit, you would enable us and empower us to surrender to that desire to worship. And that you would give us a braveness to step outside of the box and give you all the worship that we can pour out of our being with absolute and total abandonment. And I know with faith believing that you will come and sit and dwell in the middle of those praises. And I thank you in advance for it. That it'll be like nothing we've ever seen or experienced before. I thank you, Father, for the word that you brought to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.